field. If this size is smaller than roughly four times the Josephson uh, penetration depth, uh, the, the field will fully penetrate uh, in a homogeneous way your barrier. So you have just a homogeneous induction field penetrating across the barrier. <laughs> yeah. That means in that case, B of X is not screened, it's just penetrating through the barrier. Yeah. But also extending uh, partially uh, up to the London penetration depth uh, into the two electrodes. And that gives you immediately the magnetic flux, phi j, which you will have uh, uh, in the barrier, which is the, the magnetic induction B times the uh, magnetic thickness in, in Z direction times the size of your junction along X direction. Okay. Uh, now, if your B is uh, constant, you can simply integrate uh, d delta dx uh, along the x direction. And that gives you now the important result that in this case of the short junction, uh, your phase difference, if you apply a magnetic field uh, in y direction, just linearly increases along x direction. Yeah. And uh, the slope of this increase of the phase difference is just given by yeah, the applied field. Yeah. Okay, uh, so this has some important consequence for the overall radio current which you can measure across the junction. Uh, so if you take this result uh, for now the spatial variation of the phase difference uh, along the junction and insert it into the first Josephson relation, now you immediately see, okay, now my supercurrent density now oscillates in space. Yeah. Uh, and it oscillates with a wavelength which is given by the inverse of this uh, induced magnetic flux phi j or the induced magnetic induction B. Yeah. And I just uh, depicted here schematically uh, four situations. So if your applied field is zero, you have no flux in the junction, you, can have a, you will have a homogeneous uh, supercurrent uh, because uh, it's just spatially constant. If you apply a field which, corres which corresponds to uh, phi j, just half of flux quantum, you will have just uh, one uh, half wave uh, uh, of change of uh, the supercurrent density. If you apply exactly a field which corresponds to one phi naught, you just have exactly uh, one full period of oscillation yeah, uh, through your junction or here three half periods if phi naught is three half times, uh, if the f uh, flux in the junction is three half times phi naught. And this certainly has an effect if you now ask your question, what is the maximum supercurrent I can send through the device? Yeah. Uh, maybe I should point out, out already, I mean here, if you have exactly one flux quantum, you would uh, expect that uh, you have counter flow of supercurrents uh, and they should exactly compensate. So you shouldn't be able to transport any supercurrent through the junction at this particular uh, value of applied magnetic field or applied flux. And this you can calculate. So now we ask ourselves what is the total supercurrent through the junction. So we have to integrate Js of x over the junction area, which is uh, the length in a direction and the length in b direction. Uh, we just consider variations in x direction uh, for simplicity. So i, s, as a function of the applied flux uh, and some, some starting value, some integration constant we will, which we will get out is given by uh, this expression. So we have to integrate over the x dy. So the integration of dy gives us just uh, the extension of the junction in, uh, in the y direction. And we have here the result of the integral. And uh, okay, you can rewrite this. Uh, you have here the prefactor is simply the maximum supercurrent, so the maximum supercurrent density times the area of the junction, and then you have this sine pi phi j over phi naught divided pi phi j over phi naught time this uh, sinus term, uh, where you have let's say as, as one degree of freedom is the choice of the starting point of the phase difference at the left edge of the junction. And for a given supercurrent, uh, the starting phase will adjust accordingly uh, to give you uh, yeah, uh, the right supercurrent. However, if you ask for the maximum supercurrent, uh, obviously the maximum supercurrent for the junction is achieved when this term is just plus or minus one. Yeah, so that's the maximum supercurrent the junction can sustain. 
and this uh, gives you finally uh, this famous result uh, that uh, the Greer current as a function of flux uh, modulates uh, and this is depicted here from a measurement from a niobium aluminum oxide niobium SAS tunnel junction at 4.2 K. So this gives rise to this famous Fraunhofer pattern. Yeah. And this immediately tells you if, you're, if you're, uh, the area of your junction is quite large, you need only very small uh, magnetic field to induce uh, a magnetic flux quantum and at exactly one flux quantum or integer number of flux quanta your Greer curve will go to zero. If you apply many flux quanta it just vanishes out. Yeah. And that makes, uh, that means in, in the beginning when for example Chever started uh, quasi-particle tunneling also in SIS junctions he missed the Josephson effect because uh, his junctions uh, were not operated in screened magnetic field. Uh, so you have to screen, uh, uh, shield uh, the junctions or make them very small, then they are not so susceptible to external fields anymore to be able to absorb the maximum Josephson current. Okay. Um, now I come to uh, the so-called resistively and capacitively shunted junction model, which is, I mentioned already in the beginning, is, is a very simple model to describe the dynamics of the phase difference across the junction. And uh, yeah, he, the model is, is depicted here as this equivalent cir uh, circuit. So basically uh, what you assume is that your injected current through the junction uh, now flows through uh, different current paths. One is uh, the copper pair uh, tunneling current, uh, which is IS. You may also have a tunneling of uh, quasi particles, IQP. And in the RCSJ model, one makes a very, very simple approximation. One assumes this quasi particle uh, contribution to be only a, simply an ohmic current, yeah, uh, described by an ohmic resistor R. Yeah. And uh, yeah, typically, for, in particular for this uh, yeah, planar tunnel junctions, you certainly also have a capacitance uh, in your device. So you have, for time varying uh, components, you also have a displacement current ID, which flows across this capacitance. Yeah. So you have these three expressions for the Strassefsen current, the displacement current, which scales with the time derivative of the voltage, and the quasi particle current, which is thus Ohm's law u divided by r. Uh, and if you consider operation at finite temperature, which becomes later important for fluctuations, uh, any resistor at any finite temperature uh, contains Nyquist noise, uh, and so you have also uh, associated uh, Nyquist noise current source. Uh, so this is thermal noise with a spectral density, which is just proportional to KBT uh, times the resistance of this shunt resistor. So in real devices, uh, one, uh, you can have some intrinsic shunting effects uh, depending on the barrier types, or you may really use an extrinsic uh, shunt uh, to control the resistance of the, of the device. <coughs> and then you simply uh, sum up all the current contributions by using Kirchhoff's law, and via the second Josephson relation, you replace uh, the derivative of voltage with time and the voltage and then you end up with an equation of motion for the phase difference uh, yeah, across the junction. And uh, this contains very high frequency Josephson oscillations with an experiment you, you are not able to see. Uh, so what you measure in the experiment is not you, this is that just the time average V uh, average over a time which is much larger than the inverse Josephson frequency. And this gives you then at the end this typical current versus voltage curves, uh, which is here now obtained by some numerical simulation, uh, some solution of this uh, equation of motion. So what you do in numerical simulations, you, you, you solve this equation uh, to d determine uh, the time derivative of delta versus t. From that you get the voltage and by averaging you, uh, you get the voltage v for any given bias current and then this gives rise to this typical uh, current voltage characteristics. Sorry, what was beta there? Uh, this will come in a second, sorry. Yeah. And, and so, do you consider the, the vacuum, the resistance? Sorry? The resistance of the vacuum. The resistance of the vacuum, no. I mean, this is typically, we are talking here about resistances in the ohm range. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Maybe for your experiments it uh, can be very different, you can change this. Yeah, yeah. 
but typically this is uh, yeah, for devices where you have ohmic resistor, uh, which also means you never reach the gap because you, you have this shunt resistor and you are also working at very low voltages essentially. How much do I, am I doing in time? I thought, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. Uh, so we can rearrange uh, this equation of motion a little bit, putting the delta two dot and delta dot terms on the on the left side, and here the current terms uh, on the right side, and we can express this as the derivative uh, with respect to the so-called uh, tilted washboard potential, which is a very useful concept to kind of uh, get an intuitive picture of this evolution of, of the phase difference uh, in the dynamic state, in particular of the time derivative of the phase difference. Uh, so, so yeah, if you plug this in, uh, uh, this tilted watch potential, which is just a cosine type potential, which is tilted by uh, current, so I is just the applied current normalized to the maximum current I naught, and the prefactor Ej is the so-called Trosevson coupling energy. And if you arrange uh, this equation that way, you see that uh, mathematically an analog, uh, analogous system is the point-like particle, is the equation of a motion of a point-like particle along one coordinate x direction in so-called tilted washboard potential. So the structure of this equation is exactly the same as this one here. And now, uh, yeah, if you want to get an idea about solutions uh, of, of the uh, uh, equation of motion of your phase dynamics, you can always think about a particle moving in such a cosine shaped uh, potential and by applying a, a current you are tilting this potential yeah. because the potential is this one here. Yeah. And you can associate in this mechanical analog system the mass uh, corresponds to the capacitance, the friction coefficient uh, corresponds to the conductance 1 over R, the force in this mechanical system corresponds to the, the, the current you are applying and the velocity, yeah, this is just the time derivative of the phase difference and this via the second Schlossessen relation uh, corresponds to a voltage. Yeah. So if you look at uh, force velocity curves in this uh, mechanical system, this is nothing like IV curves uh, in the Schlossessen junction. Yeah. Okay, and now you can also again consider yeah, two simple cases. One is the steady case. You have no tilt, no current applied. Your particle is trapped in one of the minima and the average of the phase will be zero. However, if you now start to tilt uh, the potential by applying a current, uh, when the normalized current is exactly one, that means when I uh, is exactly I zero, your minima in the washboard potential disappear and the particle starts to roll down, which means it evolves a velocity and it just in junction it evolves a voltage. Yeah. That means that again tells you uh, I equals I, I naught is the critical current uh, of the Joseph junction. Yeah. So this is, let's look for the now for the beginning at this black curve, so increase the current up to, to I naught and then its uh, uh, voltage develops gradually and if your tilt is very large, uh, your velocity is just the, the driving force uh, divided by the friction coefficient. That means in the case of the George Edson junction, if your current is much larger than I not, you just have this, this ohmic behavior. So, so this, uh, this curve approaches this, just this ohmic line and the slope if I plot I versus V is just the inverse resistance of the junction. Okay, uh, now, yeah, let's come to this beta C. This is the so-called Macambro parameter. If you do simulations to solve this equation of motion, you usually do it in uh, normalized uh, units. So you normalize currents to I naught, also the noise current, if you, uh, if you take into account finite temperatures. Uh, you have a characteristic voltage Vc, which is I naught times R. It's also called the I naught R product. Uh, which you can use define to, to define a characteristic frequency omega c, which is proportional to I naught r, which gives you a characteristic inverse time, and you can normalize uh, your time to the inverse uh, characteristic frequency. And if you do this and write the equation of motion, you end up with this, this normalized equation of motion. Again, you have this uh, the second derivative term of the phase difference, the first derivative with respect to time. The, sinus delta term and the currents on the right side. And this is very, this way to write the equation of moment, uh, motion is very convenient because now uh, 
you have this uh, suab McCampbell parameter, which contains all the, the quantities which describe your junction in the RSJ model, I0, R, and C. Yeah. And this term determines how strong is the effect of this inertial term with respect to the damping, uh, with respect to the friction term. Yeah. And this gives you two regimes which you can find when you first increase your current up to high uh, voltage and then you come back. Uh, and in the case of strong damping, that means when beta C is very small, you can forget about this inertial term. Yeah. You are dominated by the friction term. And as soon as your minima, by tilting back this uh, washout potential, as soon as your minima reappear, the particle gets retrapped at I equals I naught. So that means you have a non hysteretic IV curve like the black one shown here. So if you come back, you again uh, get to the zero voltage state at I equals I naught. Yeah. However, uh, if your inertial term dominates, and that's the so-called weak damping regime, this beta C is very large. Uh, even though you have re uh, tilted back your potential and you developed already the minima in the washpot potential because of the strong inertial term, your particle rolls further and further, and uh, it will only be, be stopped at a much smaller uh, retrapping current, and this is shown, for example, for this red curve. So the black one is for beta C of 0 0.2, and the red curve is for beta C of 2, yeah, where you develop now this uh, hysteresis in the IV characteristics. So in these simulations, uh, there is no noise? Uh, yeah, zero. sorry, I forgot. In, in that simulations, I, I took uh, the temperature equal to 0. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can, up, can come up with, uh, there's a simple derivation which you also find in Likarev's uh, book, uh, which, which relates uh, beta C to the ratio of this return current divided by naught. Yeah. But this is an approximation. Uh. So typically what values of the capacity resistances do you have there? Uh, resistance are typically ohms and capacitance are typically on the picofarad range yeah, for tunnel junctions. But it depends on the type of the junctions you have. Okay. Um, one an in interesting feature, which also gives rise to important application, is uh, Shapiro steps. Uh, so, if you, in addition to your DC current, you apply an AC current with some uh, amplitude IAC and some frequency omega AC, and if you apply this in the this. Uh, AC currents in the microwave regime, which you do by uh, irradiating your junction with microwaves, uh, you develop uh, these uh, famous uh, steps in the current voltage uh, characteristics. And in the picture of this, uh, the, the particle in tilted watchword potential, uh, it's very instructive to, to explain how, how the Shapiro steps uh, come about. Uh, so you, we assume some, some average tilt by our DC current, and then the, the AC current just simply uh, oscillates the tilt up and, up and down. Yeah, yeah. I minus IAC, I plus IAC. Yeah. At uh, the frequency of, your, of our microwave, uh, which we shine on that. And then you can imagine that you may have a, a solution where the motion of your particle, of your phase difference, uh, uh, synchronizes with this external drive. Yeah. And you can imagine that you have a change uh, uh, of your phase difference just by one period. The particle goes from one, one well to the next one just within one excitation period. So you go down and up and your particle has just moved over, uh, over one well or over two or over three. So, but by an integer number. Yeah. So the, the phase difference changes by two pi times an integer number within the excitation period, which is 1 over FIC. FIC, FIC is your applied frequency of the microwave. Yeah. And then you simply calculate the velocity, uh, which is just uh, yeah, the uh, 2 pi n divided by TAC or 2 pi n times FAC. Yeah. And so this velocity gives you a finite uh, voltage N uh, labels uh, how many, by how many wells are your particle moving within one, one period of your AC drive. Yeah. And you can imagine that this, uh, this type of motion, this syn synchronized uh, motion, is stable within some interval of your average tilt. So if you change your average tilt only a little bit, uh, this synchronization can survive. And for the same DC current, uh, you will have uh, the same velocity. Yeah. Yeah. And that simply means you have steps of constant voltage, Vn. Yeah. 
which via second source system relation uh, satisfy not further by the 2 pi times the thermal derivative of delta n. And this is just an integer times the flux quantum times FAC. Yeah. And the separation is just uh, given by the flux of the of two neighboring steps is just the flux quantum times uh, your, your AC, uh, the frequency of your AC drive. Again, one millivolt divided by 480, 3.6 gigahertz times uh, the frequency. And this uh, has an important application because that's the way how you realize the voltage standard. Yeah. So this voltage for a single junction is very small. It also depends on frequency. So the voltage standard operates typically at 70 gigahertz. Uh, so on one junction, uh, on the nth step, you get 0.144 millivolt. And then one puts thousands of junctions in series. And this way, you can create a voltage standard, a 10 volt voltage standard, with an uncertainty of 10 to, 10 to the 10. Yeah, so you have an accuracy uh, of your 10 volt standard with uh, one nanovolt. Yeah. And the nice thing, uh, yeah, of the Shapiro steps is the fact that, uh, yeah, the step voltage is only defined by the frequency which you can uh, generate at an extremely high pre precision, and the flux quantum, which is natural constants. So there is no material constants of the junctions yeah, which come into play. So what produces the uncertainty of one nanovolt? Um, what produces the uncertainty. Uh, I mean, you still operate at finite temperature. It's, I mean, practice is how steep is your step. And, and uh, yeah, and you have also some, always some fluctuations. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what, what at the end is the main limiting factor. Limiting factor. Yeah. I guess it's not the stability of the, of the frequency. As far as I know, okay. Uh, maybe I should. We can make a little break uh, for questions, maybe. Yeah, we can also make a break for questions now, or I can. How about I take a bit shorter for the squid part, but still we can take a break uh, for questions when I'm done with the first part. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. So I will maybe skip a few slides, to go just briefly over finite uh, temperature effects, uh, which is uh, considered as thermal noise, uh, and which you can uh, consider as this uh, stochastic uh, force in the equation of motion. So then you have a lerscher type equation, and which you can solve numerically. Uh, and typically, the result is that if you look at the current voltage characteristics, uh, you reduce a thermal noise parameter gamma, which is the thermal energy divided by the twisted coupling energy. If you remember, that's the amplitude of your washpot, uh, washpot potential. And if you now increase temperature or uh, increase KBT over EJ, uh, here this is curves calculated for values from 0 0.01 up to 1, you see that you get significant noise routing of your IB curves. This is for beta C equals 0. This is for beta C equals 2. So uh, finite noise can also uh, yeah, destroy your hysteresis in the junctions. Yeah. And this rounding uh, comes because uh, if you assume that your current is close to but still slightly below uh, I0, if you have fluctuations which also tilt uh, your potential, the sum of the applied currents times uh, this fluctuation current can overcome I0, and then you will produce some voltage pulses. Yeah. And if you average over them, you will get already below I0 some finite voltage. Yeah. And if KBT becomes larger and larger, this raw nodding, raw noise running becomes stronger and stronger. And if KBT equals the choice of coupling energy, yeah, you don't see any, see any trace of IC anymore. It looks like an ohmic line. OK. Uh, one can rewrite this noise parameter uh, a bit, so you can express it as a ratio of, of a thermal noise current divided by a knot, while the thermal noise current is just then proportional to the temperature. Yeah. Just to give you some numbers, at 4K, this thermal noise current is about 0 0.2 microamps. At 77K, it's about 2 microamps. And you have already a significant suppression of your uh, visible critical current even if your noise parameter is 10 to minus 2. Yeah, so you have to be careful if you want to extract I0 from your IV curves, uh, what is, at which temper are, uh, temperature are you and, and uh, uh, what would you expect for a gamma, how strong would your suppression, uh, your noise running already be. Yeah. 
if you want to extract precisely or to a, a good uh, precision I not, you have to do numerical simulations fitting your IV curves. Okay, um, let me, I would suggest I simply, simply uh, skip most of the von of f noise part. I just want to mention uh, there is also, so this the thermal noise, uh, if you let, take a spectrum, is white. Uh, it's frequency independent, uh, Nyquist noise. Uh, there is also another important source of noise in Josephson junctions, which is also important for squids. It's so called 1 over F noise. Origin is due to defects in the barrier, which uh, leads to trapping and detrapping of, of uh, charge carriers in the barrier, which change the barrier height, which change I naught, but which also change R. And a single trap typically uh, induces this uh, random telegraph signals and if you take a spectrum you get such a Lorentzian spectrum and if you, uh, yeah, if you have a superposition of many traps, if you have many uh, traps in, uh, in, in your barrier, there's a model developed by Data, Diamond and Horn uh, and I will skip all that, but this model tells you at the end that you can show that the spectral density of current fluctuations or resistance fluctuations uh, in many cases scales as 1 over uh, f, the frequency f. Yeah. And this illustrates that you can already by taking account a few traps, I took here uh, six traps with different characters frequencies, if uh, you, you uh, add those up, uh, you have the Lorentz spectrum gives you a 1 over s squared decay uh, above a characteristic frequency and if you add a few traps you get already uh, close to 1 over f noise. Yeah. Okay, um, very last part is uh, let's say a more recent classification of different types of torch junctions which developed throughout the last one or two decades. I'm not talking about the many types of, of choice junctions, let's say the way they are fabricated. I guess Francesco will cover some of them tomorrow. Uh, but uh, those junctions certainly can also have different current phase relations. Yeah. So, uh, and you can derive the Josephson energy from any uh, current phase relation simply by, by assuming that you start at zero current, you increase your current in time which gives you also a voltage and you integrate the current times the voltage and this gives you this Josephson energy. Yeah. Um, and uh, for the symbol CPR, for the symbol current phase relation I discussed so far, uh, I know time, time cell and delta, you arrive at this washboard potential. Yeah. One minus cosine delta. This is shown here. And now you can say, okay, if I have uh, this, this uh, Josephson energy, what is the ground state? Uh, the ground state, the minimum energy is just when my phase difference is zero, which you have for a zero current. And that's why this type of junction is also called a zero junction. Yeah. Uh, but now you may also have different uh, CPRs. You, you may have a CPR where you have uh, this additional term minus pi uh, in the sine function. Yeah. And this has been shown experimentally that this is possible by the Ryazanov group if you have a ferromagnetic barrier uh, in your tunnel junction. Uh, and then you can, uh, you find that by integration of the CPR, uh, your Josephson energy gives you a minimum uh, at delta equals pi. Uh, so the ground state delta is, is at pi, not at, at, at zero anymore. That's why these junctions are called pi Josephson junctions. You may also have uh, some junctions where you uh, shift uh, the CPR by some value between zero and pi. This is then called a phi-naught junction. The ground state is at a finite value phi-naught. Or finally, you may have a CPR where you have a significant uh, second harmonic term in your current phase relation. And if the amplitude of the second harmonic is negative and large enough, at least uh, more than 0 0.5 times uh, the amplitude of the first harmonic, uh, you get uh, a degenerated uh, bistable ground state uh, which can, so the phase difference can be plus or minus uh, phi and this is then called a phi Josephson junction. And these three types, the pi, the phi not the phi Josephson junction are interesting devices uh, which are currently studied because they provide a phase, shift, a phase shift or you can use them as a phase battery which you connect to a load and one application has been demonstrated by, by Otlab et al. that you can get rid of many biasing wires in, in superconducting circuits uh, to realize such an RSFU flip-flop, for example, introducing these pi loops somewhere in the designs. 
or this has been also demonstrated by Feofano et al. that you can create a phase qubit in SFS pi junctions, uh, which also uh, provides some self-biasing effect. Uh, the phi junction uh, is even more than just a, provides just more than a phase battery. Uh, you have this degenerate to ground state, uh, and you can construct them from periodic zero pi Josephson junctions on the simplex case, just two facets, one pi and one zero facet. You can derive again the Josephson energy. I will not show how this is done. Uh, I just want to point out uh, so you have the washboard potential, uh, that's the term we know already from the first harmonic. If you have a significant amplitude of the second harmonic, so this is the ratio.